get us started. So I will tell you that when they start, that one of the dads is going to step around and video. Oh yeah, that's totally so fine. He asked if he could have permission to come to the game. I said that's, right. yes. that's great. Okay. Here we go. Good evening. I'd like to call the regularly scheduled meeting of the Waterloo Community Schools Board of Education to order and ask that you all join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You guys, I love the fact that I can hear young students speaking the pledge. It's awesome. It makes me very happy. So um, we'll get to you guys in just one more minute here. <coughs> yep. There you guys. We'll be ready for you in just a minute. We have a couple other items to get through first. So um, Jesse Knight is going to read our mission statement this evening. Waterloo Schools Community commits to a comprehensive system of education and support to assure that each and every student will graduate, prepare for college, career, and citizenship, as evidenced by continuing education, pursuing a career path, and contributing to a community. Thank you, Jesse. The next item on our agenda then is information from um, individuals and delegations. And I'm just checking this evening to see if there's anyone here who wis wishes to address the board. We do have um, a public hearing on the Orange Elementary property as well later in our agenda. Um, so I'm just checking to see if anybody else is here this evening. Alrighty, then we'll move on to that public hearing. And I would like at this point to declare the public hearing open and ask if there are any comments. All right. Then seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. And a second. Second. And this requires a roll call vote. So I'm going to start down here to my left. Jesse Knight. Yes. Angie Weekly. Yes. Sue Flynn. Yes. Aunt Rhonda McCrina. Yes. <coughs> Mike Kinchy, excuse yes. me. Lyle Schmidt. Shanley McNally Chair votes aye. And the hearing is now closed. Thank you. That takes us then to the next item on our agenda, which is Exhibit B, the one you guys are all here for, which is for our um, <coughs> Kingsley Elementary students that are here this evening. And I'm not sure. I know we have Robin Les in the audience. Is Angela here too? Oh, there you are, Angela. Sorry. <laughs> Do you guys want to start? Are your students going to start? Robin, will you make sure that that button, there's a little push button? Hi. There, now, thank <laughs> I'm you. I'm Robin Les from Kingsley Elementary, and this is our girls only team. We are um, excited that we have three teams at Kingsley a girls only team, a boys only team, and a girls and boys team. Two of our teams are going to the Ames um, competition this weekend, and the third team should be there too. Um, they're just going to tell you uh, present for you their presentation their project was to get more books for um, the school the whole theme of the Lego leagues uh, this year was um, animal allies oh. and so they're doing they're trying to get more nonfiction animal books in Kingsley Elementary awesome. all right guys take it away This is our team of fourth and fifth grade girls. We knew we worked as buzzy as bees for this day. We knew immediately we couldn't do any type of project without seeking first to understand what our peers knew about animals. On the class Chromebooks, we surveyed the 141 fourth and fifth grade students at Kingsley. We also asked several questions concerning their sources of information. The results showed that our students are a bunch of bookworms who want to have more <laughs> animal books. Our goal is to get more nonfiction animal books for the school and classroom library. About 70% of the students we surveyed had an interest in reading nonfiction animal books. We counted all the animal books in the fourth and fifth grade classrooms and our school library. 
Holy cow. When we when we finally finished counting, we discovered that our libraries only have 92 nonfiction animal books. Total. <laughs> Our school does not have the qualifications to meet our students' needs. Hold your horses, we're not done. We also had a question in the survey about which animals interested the students. About 35% of the kids are interested in reading more about panthers. Other animals they're interested in are monkeys, penguins, and polar bears. We were dog tired when we were done with our work. We counted books in the classrooms. We talked to individual teachers about the survey results. 51% of the students feel that Kingsley's school library does not have enough animal books. 74% feel that their classroom libraries don't either. Not only do the kids want more, so do the teachers. When we counted what we had available, we found that Kingsley only has 880 animal books. We realize this is nothing to monkey around with, and we have a lot of work to do. <coughs> we learned from the survey that kids really want to learn more about dolphins. When we researched how many books our entire school owned, we found only 21 dolphin books in the entire school. Two, two classrooms in the entire school only had one nonfiction animal book. Luckily, Miss Reginald's book was a dolphin book. That's a fish out of water. The teachers literally told us they want more nonfiction animal book books. Miss Smith said I wish I had the time and money to go get more nonfiction animal books. So we decided to take the bull by the horns. A little birdie of a coach named Robin told us we should consult our school's leader of the pack, Miss Seats. Miss Seats steered us to a grant opportunity to purchase nonfiction animal books for the Kingsley students. Mallory and Jocelyn got help from Jean Seeland from the Volunteer Center of Cedar Valley to write a grant for books we didn't monkey around. We asked for $1,000 to purchase 494 nonfiction animal books. Kingsley Elementary is our circle of control. We knew if we received the McElroy Grant, our project would have affected more than 375 students in our school. We found out in mid-December that we did not receive the McElroy Grant. At first, we thought it was a catastrophe, but we dried our crocodile tears because we know there is more than one way to skin a cat. Alexis and Sydney wrote a proposal to the Kingsley PTO asking for $2,000 to buy animal books for our school. We will find out about this funding in February. We will keep trying until the cows come home. This is Hannah. I have butterflies in my stomach. She wants you to know that Kingsley Elementary is in the doghouse because students want to learn about animals. But the school needs more books. She also wants you to know that we were as busy as beavers researching 127 different nonfiction animal books sold at Barnes & Noble. Our hope is to continue finding additional ways to find funds for these books. Keep listening. Other resources we can apply to get more animal books are the Cedar Valley United Way, Waterloo Community School Foundations, and Kingsley PTO. We want to get hundreds of animal books. Sorry we seem to have ants in our pants, but we're just super excited about our group project to get more nonfiction animal books for our school. See you later, alligators. Do you want to know more about what we've done? daily basis. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, so now it's our time to ask questions, right? Yes. Before I get to the questions, can I also just acknowledge there's a couple other people here. I want to just acknowledge your other coach, Stacy Mills. Can you wave? And I think you've got a couple mentors that work with you in the back. Am I correct? Are they both here? Is Craig here? No. Anybody? Those guys here? Okay. No, I just can't see everybody. There you go. Gotcha. Okay. We just want to thank them, too, for being awesome support because you guys would be a lot to corral, I have a feeling. So, <laughs> it's right up my alley, let me tell you. Cows. <laughs> okay. All right, I would questions. like each of you to tell us your name and your favorite animal and what grade you are in school and what do you want to be when you grow up. Four questions. My like a hyena. My name is Nora Nazri. I am a fourth grader at Kingsley Elementary. My favorite animal is a penguin, and I want to be an author when I grow up. All right. <coughs> Hi. <coughs> Hi, my name is Isabel Rand. Um, I am a fourth grader here at Kingsley. My favorite animal is a jellyfish, and I want to be a teacher when I grow up. Hello, my name is Alexis Steinwell. I'm a fourth grader at Kingsley. My favorite animal is a dog, and I want to be an engineer when I grow up. Right. My name is Tessa Pabri. I am in fourth grade. My favorite animal is a ring-tailed lemur, and I want to be a magician when I grow up. My name is, my name is Natalie Schmadke. I am a fourth grader at, here at Kingsley, and uh, my favorite animal is a cat, and when I grow up, I'd like to be a professional swimmer. My name is Hannah Williams. Um, my favorite animal is a hamster, and when I grow up, I want to be a, a vet. My name is Sydney Grant. I am a fourth grader at Kingsley. My favorite animal is a red panda, and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> That's Hi, my name is Jocelyn McGilgan. I am a fifth grader at Kingsley. My favorite animal is a cheetah, and I want to be a veterinarian when I grow up. Hello, my name is Mallory Mills, and I am in fifth grade, and I want to be a surgeon when I grow up, and my favorite animal is a cheetah. They have... Um, when they found out they didn't get the grant, they needed to do some more work going forward toward Ames. And so we did have a couple girls um, do some research. Well, they all did some research, and then we did uh, wrote a proposal to the Kingsley. But tell them what surprising fact we found out on our second survey about the kids with library cards at Kingsley. We found out from our survey that most of the kids don't have library cards. So at the read-in, we are going to be giving out library cards to the people that don't have any. Good idea. Our read-in is where all of the students at Kingsley are, are asked to attend to our school um, in the gym where uh, they can bring books from home and read um, and just like meet up with their friends. They're also allowed to be in their pajamas. <laughs> oh, pajamas. Nice. Board members, anybody else have any questions for these precocious young women? Well, I want to say, did you, did you have, are you all? Are you guys done? I didn't mean to interrupt you can't see behind that monitor so I can't there you go <laughs> I'll let you continue if you like um we also can't we have donuts and stuff to drink there <laughs> very nice all right you want to go ahead do you have any more questions well no questions just comments if that's okay that's I wanted to congratulate you all and um, let's take a second just to give them a hand <laughs> So let, let me just, I don't, can you all hear me okay? Because I can't, okay. I, uh, let me just explain to you why you all are phenomenal, okay? So 
you, you may not have ever been inside of a college oral communications classroom, but your presentation skills were awesome. Okay, that's number one. Okay, your verbal communication skills were awesome. Number two, your research skills. And you also may not have ever been inside of a, a dissertation presentation, but the quantitative, the, the, the pie charts, and all of those things are things that people who work on their doctorate have to do. And so I was very impressed with your overall presentation skills, the research that you did, the use of surveys, and the reporting. So from an academic um, standpoint, I'm very, very proud and impressed with you all. So knock, knock. Cows go. Mm -hmm. No, silly. Cows go moo. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd like to. <laughs> Thank you. Very funny. And um, and I'd like to make a donation to your book project. Okay. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> and one last thing, ladies, I want to say I'm very impressed that all of you are here tonight because that's no small feat to get your whole group in front of somebody. I know that's a hard thing, and I really appreciate you all taking the time. We all do to come out on a Monday night when you're not normally supposed to be here. We really appreciate you doing that tonight. So thank you very yeah. much. And you're going to get to Ames. Don't you worry. Thank you. Good. Don't worry. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. I, that was awesome. I'm kind of a nonfiction person, so I Bye. appreciate that. The only Bye. thing I don't understand is why rat, rats didn't make the rats. Cut <laughs> They might have, yeah, exactly. So, all right, we'll let them head about their way before we move on to the next item on our agenda. I do want to make just a brief announcement this evening. Um, both our superintendent and one of our board members, we have a mandatory meeting for our eighth grade families this evening, uh, of which our superintendent will be presenting, and one of our board members has an eighth grader, and so they will be leaving us in about an hour, and I just want to let our public know that when they get up and leave, I haven't offended them. They, they're just on their way out the door. So um, with that, we will move on to our consent agenda this evening. <coughs> And the items on the consent agenda consist of the minutes of the December 12, 2016 regular board meeting. I can get it up here. Um, personnel appointments and adjustments, bills due and payable, and bills paid between board meetings <coughs> and labor negotiations team. <coughs> can I get those? Uh, actually, first, are there any items that uh, members wish to have removed? Then seeing none, can I get those items on the table, please? So moved. Thanks, Jesse. And a second? Second. Then all those in favor of approval of the consent agenda items C, D, E, and F, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Chair votes aye. Motion carried. That takes us to the next item on our agenda, which is item G. <coughs> and that is um, the recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the Old Orange Elementary School demolition project and publish a notice to bidders. So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank Mike moved and Sue seconded. Um, and is there any discussion? I know uh, Michael Coughlin's here for that, or if, if I know we on the uh, facilities might be able to answer questions if anybody has. Do we have a ballpark estimate? What the cost might be? No. This no. is just a, a notice to take bids, so. Yeah, I don't have that information. Okay. I think we have some ideas in our minds based on previous oh. projects, but right. if okay. we say. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> if we say, then we, we don't tip our hands, so I think we'll hold off on yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Fair enough. And okay. one thing I want to say, you know, I live out that direction, so you all know that I drive by those that building a lot, um, and that it we have removed the asbestos and everything and we are very anxious to move forward mm -hmm. a little bit even ahead of schedule and that's why we're looking at um, going ahead and going out for bid um, this early in January because you know the building doesn't look the greatest the windows are out and we know that and so we are working hard and diligently to take care of that and and get that building down assuming that the board approves the project tonight exactly right, right. right. Yeah. I was gonna say yep. that yep. would depend on the vote that hasn't yes. happened yet so exactly just to note it might be good to inform the public that one of the reasons we do this in the winter time is that this is some work that can be done yeah. during the winter and actually we could get a better price 
because a lot of contractors are not working um, on other projects during the winter. So um, it's advantageous to do this this time of year. And I just wanted to add too that again I think this is a true sign of the district's diligence to um, um, living up to their word you know mm -hmm. that this yeah. is a building sure. that we um, built a new building and it has not been there what they've been in orange what three, three. years three years so um, we are getting that a lot sooner than some of our other buildings down and um, I think it is following course that we build and then we take down the old and we have promised to do that to the neighborhoods and I think we are um, living up to that promise so I just wanted to thank the administration the district for allowing that to continue to happen we should probably also note what's going to happen to this property we don't know yet yeah. it's okay, it goes so to the city will, that's what i was getting at is right. it, it will become city property yeah yeah it was part of our trade with the uh, land uh, swap for the bus garage so not sure what their plans are we can go to a city council meeting and maybe find out <laughs> Yeah. They meet right now, exactly. So at five, right. Um, all right, is there anything further then? Great. Then all those in favor of approving the recommendation, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Chair votes aye. Motion carried. Great. Then that takes us next to item H on our agenda, and that is the 2017-18 high school planning <coughs> guide and course catalog and the recommended motion here I have to get to the bottom of my uh, exhibit is that the Board of Education approve the 2017 2018 high school planning guide course catalog so moved thanks Jesse and a second second great and discussion I know that we have Crystal Buzza and Debbie Lee here thank you both for being here and I'm sure we'll have some questions after you guys present to us we always count on that right <laughs> yep um, so here we are with a high school planning guide and there were some very major changes in it this year uh, we hoped that the exhibit actually highlighted those major changes for you but we I want to run by run through just a couple of those with you and then we'll entertain the questions I also want to introduce a few people who are out in the audience as well so um, one of the first things that I want to just to talk about is the huge collaborative effort that goes into the high school planning guide this is not something that Crystal and I sit at our desk and scheme up and, and say, hey, let's do this or let's do that. We actually bring the teachers in who are the content specialists. They know their content. They know what is needed by the students in their classroom. So we bring those uh, department chairs in and we ask them to take information back to their teachers and to have conversations about what are those changes that really need to happen. What courses do we need to add that drive our students further into the 21st century and those rigorous learning um, opportunities? And then what courses are we just not using anymore or we don't need to be using or we just need to take off the plate? So there were some major, there was major work this year done in some of those areas. Um, so the collaborative um, part of it, I think, is very, very important. And um, I hope that you get a sense of that as we go through this. Of course, there are uh, different kinds of things that we do, like we adjust course numbers, we adjust the sked numbers, we adjust narratives if the content just needs a little bit of tweaking or something. That is always done, and I don't always highlight those, or we would have 55 pages probably in the exhibit, and that's not necessary. Um, <clears throat> there was a change in retaking a course, and that is on page six. And, and I noted that in the exhibit, but I wanted to highlight that for you. We are adding on, using our Edgenuity online courses, another way for students to pass a course if they have shown an almost that they have passed. Sometimes we have students who might miss a major project or a major assignment, they get a big old zero on that, and it brings down all of their other grades. We are trying to move slowly toward a more competency-based approach. So he said, if the students have between a 55 and 59% in their final grade, and they choose to want to take the cumulative test that accompanies a corresponding course in our list of online courses, they can take that test. 
If they get a 70% or above on that test, they will pass then the course with a C. If they get between 60, 69%, they will pass the course with a D. Even if they ace that cumulative test, they will not get an A for that retake on the course. So uh, that's a new practice. It's not in policy, so we can, we can put those guidelines into being. That was a suggestion by one of our principals. We had conversation about that, and it's just another way for our students to be able to approach showing that they have um, shown competencies. The edgenuity courses, the e old E2020 courses, they align with standards, and we continually work on customizing those. That's a new program, software program for us this year. But we did want to bring that to your attention so that you know we are doing everything we can on a continuum of what we believe is right to give kids a chance to show what they know and what they can apply. We think that's very important. Um, we are adjusting the ELL courses. One of the big things we did with those is we noted on the ELL courses which ones count for graduation credit in that content area. And there are implications for that, and we meet all of those implications. The other thing is there were questions about some of the ELL courses and how they work within the Regents Admission Index. So I had a great conversation with um, uh, Representative Jason Pontius from um, the Regents, and um, he advised us on what we could do with our course numbers to be able to make it happen that some of the ELL courses will now count in the um, RAI, the Regents Admission Index. And that's a big plus for our ELL students. And that's a, for me, it's a big equity issue as well. So now they can take those courses and what they're learning is um, the course content is the same as our general course, but we are using specific ELL strategies in there to help those students pass those courses. So that will set them up to be able to go to the universities. And we thought that was really important as well. Um, there also, um, format changes I wanted to bring to your attention. All of the uh, previous career, career clusters and pathways, we moved that section to the back to act more as a reference section rather than be up front because it kind of got caught in the way of trying to get to the courses. And so we thought that would be a really good move to make and we've gotten real positive uh, response from that. And we also then moved two of Waterloo's uh, really important high school signature uh, courses or signature pathways right up front. So uh, when we get past um, um, some of the narratives in the front, what you see right away is the Waterloo Career Center. And then immediately after that, you see the International Baccalaureate courses. And we pulled all the Waterloo Career Center courses are all in that section. Uh, we also, all of the IB courses we pulled out of the content areas and we put those and streamlined those as well right there so they're easier to see. So I think those are really very important format changes that I wanted to highlight for you. And then we get down to the content changes. And one of the most important content changes is in the area of science. And so because of the huge changes in that area, I wanted to introduce you to the four people sitting here behind me. So um, on your left would be Alex Conyers, and then Rod Wallace, Anjali Myers, and of course, Angela Hewitt. And Rod and Alex are the two department chairs for East and West High. Anjali is our curricular leader in the K-12 District Science Committee. And um, Angela Hewitt really is the coordinator, facilitator, or director, or whatever we call her, across our science programming. Um, and so they are instrumental in pulling the ideas together and pulling the teachers together around this. The decisions that were made in science were not my decisions. You need to know that. Rod and Alex took lots of information back from the committees and they kept meeting with their PLC science groups at the high school level over the course of about a year, year and a half, almost two years. Um, Angela and Anjali worked with them in their agendas and with the professional development that they provided the teachers. But they would come up with the ideas, here are the new standards for science, next generation science standards. And how is this gonna change our current science programming? 
what do we need to do? Can we bundle these into units? What curriculum do we need to develop or go purchase in regard to these new standards? And how do we wrap these science standards into a correct course sequence? These are the, exactly the same um, challenges that other uh, school districts in Iowa have been facing and, are, and have been dealing with. So they worked and worked and worked on this. They take the information to their teachers and then they pull it back into the committee. They take out more ideas and pull it back, back and forth. We call that the accordion model. Um, and they used it really well. So what they came down to was looking at what's the best course sequence for our high school students that engage them in the standards in a rigorous inquiry approach to science. And this is what they came up with. My job was to ask them the difficult questions to help them think about things maybe they didn't think about. And of course, I loved that. That was great. I think they came up with one of the most ingenious creative plans that I have ever seen. And I love it. So hats off to these guys behind me. They're standing behind me when most of the work, I was standing behind them. They're the ones who are doing the work. I just happen to be telling you about it. So I want you to understand that and acknowledge them. So this is a new uh, era. Uh, yeah. science, what's your point? I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. OK, thank okay. you. OK. So it is a new era and approach. It's practices and content, not just content. And uh, what I, you, you are so good. Um, if you look at page one in your high school planning guide, not Roman numeral one, but just the number one, what you see on that page is our current programming. That stands for the class of 2018, 19, and 20. So this is not anything different than you've seen before. So if you turn the page over to page two and three, the top of three, what you will see then is starting with next year's freshman class. That's the class of 2021. Everything is the same here except science. In science, what you'll notice is that the ninth grade course is earth and space science. The 10th grade course is biology. That is exactly the same as what we normally have had. And then at the junior level, for most of the students at the junior level, they will choose one of four combinations. So they will choose physical science, a and B, that's a full year course, or they will choose physical science A, which is more physics based, and then a full year of chemistry, depending on what their interest area is, what their career path might be. Or they will choose physical science B, which is more chemistry based, and physics, a full year of physics. Or if they're really deep into science, they will choose a full year of chemistry and a full year of physics. Now, any one of those courses will push the students to a college level fully prepared to engage in college courses. So it's very important for us to note this is dependent on what the student chooses and what their career path and their thinking is at that time. So next year, our new curriculum will be in the area of Earth and space science. Then we have two years to develop the curriculum in that for that junior year, the physical science, chemistry, and physics. The anatomy and physiology, where is that? That stays. That's an elective course. Okay. We still have all of our other science electives, although in the exhibit, you will see we have deleted some courses because they are embedded into the earth science, like the astronomy, meteorology. Those are part of our earth science uh, did I say earth and space science course? And then we're keeping geology and ecology for a couple more years for our current 9th, 10th, 11th graders because they may need those as electives. And we'll keep looking at when do we need to delete those? What do we need to add? Okay, so that is a huge change. Yes. Question, question on, on that. that. So, yes. you know, reading through here, we're seeing that that 8th graders currently taking those advanced science classes they're not going to credit for those next year? That is a good question, and that was the next point, and that was in the exhibit. So you need to understand what is happening at that middle school level in conjunction of how it links to the high school then. 
We know that with the new standards, they are specifically grade-based. Sixth grade standards, seventh grade standards, eighth grade science standards. Our students have to engage in those specific standards. In the past, they were grade span, which gave us lots of wiggle room to be able to move them and adjust them and all of that. Well, it's a different story now. So our eighth grade students have to engage in the eighth grade standards. We are learning what those standards mean and the curriculum units that are being prepared for those. We are temporarily eliminating a science course at the middle school level that is a high school course. We have to do that. We can't have students taking their eighth grade course because of those standards and an earth science course at that eighth grade level. We're not prepared for that yet. What we are planning on is that one to two years, hopefully we'll start the conversation next spring. We'll look at how did the seventh grade curriculum, what are the units like, how did they go this year? How can we compact those to one semester? How did the eighth grade units and curriculum go? How can we compact that to a semester? so that the plan would be to build a seventh grade advanced science course that embraces both the seventh grade and the eighth grade uh, standards on a, a faster pace. That sets the eighth graders up then to be able to take the earth science. Now, when they go into ninth grade next year, we do have an advanced earth and space science for them to get involved in. So, eighth they're, they're taking that current eighth, gra eighth graders that are taking physical science now. Great. In addition, the physical science that they are taking this year will count as their physical science when they are juniors. Okay. We, these guys thought of everything, and do you <laughs> want to add anything to that? Did I get that right? I, I do have a, a, a question as well. So, I, and maybe I'm just not in this loop, but the last student that I helped that was at advanced in science, mm -hmm did not even take that ninth grade level and eighth grade and ninth grade just tested and started in biology and then went into a career in science and that was years ago because okay. he's 29 now but I'm just saying is that st is that still an option as if their aptitude is so high that like that level of science would not be enough or will not get them into I had a couple friends in college who I had to tutor in physics because they didn't offer it at their high school or they didn't get a chance to take it because of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. So there are possibilities and ways that we can help students accelerate and we have eighth graders who are taking summer courses uh, before their ninth grade to accelerate there. But I'm going to actually ask you to just stay with us on this because we are learning new standards and we are preparing new curriculum. And so those answers on how best we can serve students are gonna happen through the year next year when we are deeply embedded in all of this new curriculum and the new standards. We can individually accelerate students, but we need to have um, knowledge that they currently have met those specific standards that we expect them to. And so we have to be able to, to prepare that and to be able to say, well, here are the, here are the types of um, assessment or performances or whatever we need that we can say, yes, they've met this and we can push them on. Um, bear with us on that. This is probably, this is a lot different than new math and new literacy standards. I this just is have a to, whole new way of doing science. I have to say this out loud because I am unbelievably anxious at looking at this, but knowing that Mr. Wallace and that Angela both participated in this is bringing me a little bit of ease because I know how well that they have prepared the kids that I have worked with mm -hmm. to go into careers in math and science. So I just, that is really helping me, but I am, I don't know if you can tell, I can, I'm anxious a little bit. Well, so <laughs> let me help you understand that and tomorrow morning when we wake up, this is all not gonna, doesn't have to be ready. Right. Okay, so they are working on the earth and space science curriculum, which will be ready for next year. And then the next two years, they will continue to work on uh, upgrading our biology which is at the 10th grade, same thing, just upping it to what the expectation is in the new standards. But they also, with all of the changes at that junior level, we have two years to do that. And these folks are talented enough, they will knock that out, hands down, without a problem. So yeah. did, did I understand that correctly, though? You're saying that 
the current eighth graders that are taking classes will get credit their junior year. Yes. Okay. In Does science. that? Do we need to communication out those? those families so I know that's what's being communicated it's in the board exhibit It's being communicated through the teachers and as the counselors I have met six meetings last week and one more this week I have met with all of the high school administrators all of the middle school and high school counselors and I'm meeting with the middle school administrators on Wednesday and we are explaining all of this to them the key people in that conversation are the administrators and especially the counselors because they're the ones who help the students understand that. The counselors, uh, Dr. Lindemann, will be working with the parents in those meetings at the same time. We will be sending those uh, high school counselors go out to the middle schools, and they work with the middle schools, the eighth graders, in um, getting scheduling ready for next year. And we also have the career coordinators who go out and follow the counselors and have conversations about the career academies and careers and career clusters and all that with the middle school students as well. So there is a huge campaign going on um, that supports this in regard to communication. Great question, and I think we've got that covered. But you. you listen, and if we don't, we will make sure that we do. If I could add, too, we have a great leverage point with the District Science Committee because it has representation from every building, every grade level, and they've been part of the formation of getting the next generation science standards to the forefront. So this isn't an isolated committee working uh, in a small uh, closed room. This has been an ongoing dialogue over two years of how that we can best make sure that our students not only have a, s a strong STEM foundation for career readiness, but also have the high expectations that the universities have regarding science readiness. So let me just commend the Science Committee, not only of the communication process, but also of the, the, the difficult work of, of getting this up to the forefront and ready to go. And Dr. McNulty, that's a great point. My next question was, is there a community college liaison on this Science Committee? Not on the committee, but we are in constant communication with them in other areas. and. Um, I would like to see that happen in the future. We kind of had to start down here on the foundational level at the beginning. So that's it's a really good idea. I like that idea. So we can take that, see how we can integrate with them. And it, it appears all this change is, uh, is generated by the official adoption in August 2015 of the Iowa Core Science Standards. Did I unwittingly approve this? No, that who, was who approval the from the state level. The state board approved those as the Iowa okay. science standards, and we follow okay. the Iowa science standards. Well, okay. My question is, have we, are the standards even defined enough, or have we studied them enough to understand whether it, they're warranted, whether we even want to follow that standard? Well, uh, Mr. Schmidt, at this point in time, I could say yes that was those were all ferreted out they were addressed they were public comment was open for public comment that was a long approval process on the state's end once they are approved we are then by law committed to enacting those but we also agreed a hundred percent that these are the best standards that we've ever had this is the right pathway for science even though they're not all defined I believe they are defined I thought some of the courses were still being developed. The standards are defined. Oh. We get to then decide the courses around Put our Waterloo standards. stamp on them. That's so we mean. studied, we, Waterloo school representatives, studied those standards and decided they're right on the mark? Yes. We believe that they are. This is just another move towards Common Core, and as you know, it's pretty controversial. Some of the objections are warranted, some are not, many are not. But I don't think this is just something that you just blanket adopt what some other group said. We just still have local control of some kind, I so we don't necessarily need to adopt these standards, do we? Yes. Actually, we yes. Do. Right. That is, yep, the Department of Ed, when they adopted them, they became the Iowa curriculum. And so um, how those are, how those um, standards are taught, the instructional strategies, um, the assessments that use, are used to measure, that is local. Yes. 
but the standards are a state. So it, regardless of whatever district you go to in the state of Iowa, those are the standards that we're going, going to be teaching. In yes. the board exhibit a year ago, and the only reason I know this is because I had it out last week looking at it, the board exhibit last year gave um, a kind of a heads up um, when we did the high school planning, there was a paragraph in there about the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards, and that we wouldn't be changing science for the current year, mm -hmm. but that we would be bringing a lot of change for the following year, which is next school year, 2017-18. Mm -hmm. So this has been on our radar for quite a while, and um, our teachers have spent time in professional development. They have spent time looking and dissecting and unpacking the standards and looking at them and what they mean. And so the standards are the goal line. That's where we're headed. It's our local control to figure out how to get our students to meet that expectation. So who determines whether our local uh, curriculum meets the common core? We determine that. Okay. And that's the work that the teachers under Anjali and Angela have been working on so diligently for the last nearly two years. First, it was we have to understand the standards before we can understand how to utilize them, how to get kids engaged in them to meet that. And eventually, there should be an assessment that aligns with those as well. And so these are, you know, we're just in the middle of right now of, of saying what standards are they how can we bundle those together to create units and how are we going to assess to make sure that we are assessing exactly on what that unpacked standard is is intended um, it's a lot of work curriculum develop is tedious um, mind-bending work it's really big so it takes time to do that and we have built the time in it's been a slow steady process to ensure that the understanding is there. And the reason I'm a little nervous about this is science more than any other area lends itself to indoctrination as opposed to true true science. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen that in, in multiple areas so so how do we know that these courses don't become indoctrination? Well number one is they are not traditional lecture courses they are actually engaging students get to work through the inquiry method they are posing questions they are looking at evidence and data they're figuring things out on their own um, I can tell you it's just such a different type of of science than what we have been able to across the board bring to our students so this work is also being done at the middle school and the elementary level paralleling what the high school is doing does anybody want to comment about the type of instruction that is happening um, that would be able to address those questions? Yeah. Here's what I'd like to do. Um, I would like to invite you. Is the pilot still going on with physical science in your buildings? Is it over? Or it's done at East, but it's okay. So it has. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Come up here, Alex. We have piloted units as well. And this is just not let's go out and buy whatever we see first. Uh, units have been piloted, teachers are vetting those. Um, and there's, again, it's, we're not in a hurry to do any kind of purchasing of support resources. Um, the curriculum units and guides will be written first, and then we go find those resources. But Alex, go ahead and address the board, please. I mean, I just, I guess in order to answer Mr. Schmidt's question, I need to know what he qualifies as indoctrination. Um, bias against the use of fossil fuels. Okay, that is part of it. Uh, one of the standards does involve uh, human impacts to Earth that does not necessarily have to be taken in a fossil fuel negative um, sort of climate. So the, the standard is not written from the perspective that fossil fuels are negative. It is written from the perspective that humans have an impact on their environment though. Which is another conjecture. What about, uh, what about global warming, I think, is another question. That, 
that does fall under the imp like human impacts. Um, I wouldn't say that I have exclusively focused on carbon dioxide and not how that impacts the environment, but also nitrogen, um, the the change of use of land, for instance, for for like uh, urban areas, how that also impacts the environment, um, the building of roads, the the removal of prairie for agriculture. I mean, they both have positive and negative impacts, and I definitely work to highlight both aspects in my classroom. And so that's, that's what I was going to say, is that we teach our students critical thinking, so we provide both sides of the coin. I would imagine that they would, you know, highlight both Yeah, things. I would like to believe that I'm not indoctrinating my students. And, and that is the, that's the drive, and around the standards, the standards are not open-ended, but they allow for the inquiry approach so that students can ask the questions. So you may have some students who might believe this or might believe that, and as we dig into that and, and we see what are the hypotheses, what is the data, what conclusions can we draw from that? Um, that's really that, that whole scientific inquiry that, again, it's not just content. Our, our traditional science was based only in content. These, this science approach and these standards are practices and content. I, so I, I, think, I thank you, and I just think it's important that our students are offered both sides of the coin so that if their parents ask, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then we as educators will be able to address that um, very real concern that some people might have so thank you so does it address questions such as how will world food production how does science play a role in increasing world food production such that pop it's it uh, is proportional to the population change yeah definitely that's a human impact on the environment as we have increased crop yields and the potential to grow food on earth. How are the, the books, have you, um, resources? You, you mentioned that you would be looking into resources for each course as you get closer to it. So um, will you be bringing those to us specifically or will those be chosen um, by your group? Teachers uh, have started looking at some resources, but when we talk about resources, it doesn't necessarily mean a textbook. My posture has always been, if we can uh, provide resources that are not textbooks and it's the perfect resource, or a resource that we can supplement, that's the way we will go. So there, the books, the textbooks themselves have not quite caught up with the standards, so we're not in a hurry to, to go out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on textbooks. We're also looking at what the old term would be kits or uh, resources that are pulled together in one unit, and we're looking at some of those as well. So rather than a textbook, we would look at this resource kit, which guides the teachers in into engaging the students, students in specific activities that drive the kids into those standards and those opportunities for learning. Um, we would be bringing those kinds of resources to you. We've bought some just to pilot and to look at, but a large adoption always comes through the board for approval. And if it's your desire, we can actually set up and show you those before those are purchased. And we always do uh, sift those or vet those through criteria. It's not just, I like the pictures in this book, so let's buy this. It's, do they meet this criteria? And we rank those kinds of resources. Um, Angela has that. She has um, been using that or will be using that with the teachers. The teachers make that final decision. It's not up to me. Okay. And um, we can send you, I just asked Angela, we have copies of the Next Generation Science Standards. And we can, in the next week, get those all sent out to you if you would like to have a set of yeah. those. They are online. Yeah. If you want to look at them online, just Google um, NG yeah. NGSS or Next Generation Science Standards. But we have those printed yeah. out in books as well. And we can give those to you next week, by yeah. next week. One That'd last question. Uh, is the Iowa Core Science Standards a derivative of a national standards? Um, the next generation science standards are the next thing to national standards, but I don't think there's one set of national standards, Angela. NGSS were developed by 26 states in the nation. They were state driven. They are not federal 
standards. Right. Iowa was one of the lead states in developing the next generation science standards. Iowa core science standards are based on NGSS. So Iowa adopted the performance expectations of the NGSS. They didn't adopt the entire NGSS. And Angela, that was a clarification I wondered about the stamp. I talked about the Waterloo stamp, about how we then develop the standards are here and then how we develop the curriculum and how we get to the standard. But as I understand it, that's also the way it is for the, uh, and I'm going to say that wrong, NCSS, the, that those, the NGSS, that, the, that Iowa also had a percentage of their own so that Iowa's don't necessarily match everybody, the other 26, that they had part of that was their own to create. Am I correct in that? Iowa took what was already in place with NGSS. NGSS is just a broader document that provides additional information that Iowa chose not to adopt. Okay. Um, more information on cross-cutting concepts, the science and engineering practices. Iowa just adopted the performance expectation, which is what students should be able to demonstrate at the conclusion of learning. Okay. Thank you. What other questions might you want to ask her about science before she gets out of my class? <laughs> I don't think anything more on science necessarily, unless, Lyle, are you, do you have any more on science? I don't know. Okay. Thank you. And thank you to Thanks, the science Angela. teachers and yes, to the leaders of much. the science groups. Um, they're very important people in this process. So the next piece I wanted to highlight, and this is the last one just to let you know, um, uh, is the Waterloo Career Center. And so um, Crystal's <coughs> going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to tell you, being able to be um, deep into curriculum in this district. It has been so um, invigorating and fun for me to watch the progress that has been made with science and also with the uh, uh, career and technical education. That's, that's really awesome, uh, both of it, both pieces. So if you turn to page 34 in the plan of study guide, you'll see the first page for the Waterloo Career Center. And we do have it broken down in the five pathways. So it includes the three new pathways that we'll have for next fall. Um, and as you'll note, any of the um, courses with this. Do you need 34? Oh, 17, sorry. 17 and 34 is not quite. Yep. <laughs> I think 34 is where maybe it started in the old guide. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it's so, English now. Right. 16 and 17. <laughs> yeah. So um, with this um, particular, uh, the next page you'll kind of see, we tried to break it in, here's advanced manufacturing, here's digital graphics. Um, with this um, draft, you'll notice we have some call out boxes. There are some classes that we are calling our buddy classes, where um, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they'll take one class, and then on Tuesday, Thursday, there'll be a complementing class that will be slightly different, but within the same pathway. Um, and that's just because if they are a Hawkeye class, they might not require as many um, lecture hours or lab hours. And the way we have it built in is we have a lot more time. They're 90 minute class periods that students meet for every day. So we have the flexibility of offering or introducing something new, um, which is a really nice thing. Um, the other thing that we are very excited about being able to offer is next year for the digital graphics and then for the early childhood education we are going to bundle one of the classes with an english credit so students need uh, four years of english to graduate and usually around their senior year they pick an elective and this will allow students to get a core credit in addition to a career elective credit while they're at the career center and so we're hoping to expand that more we are really going to test that out and see how it works next year um, but anyway we can help students get their core credits along with elective credits helps them graduate. So we felt that was a really good thing to add in. So questions about the Career Center? I just was wondering, I was curious in here looking how we have offered the CAPS for Cedar <coughs> Falls in our Mm -hmm. online are they yeah. offering our career center in theirs correct Perfect. so we've been having a number of conversations with Cedar Falls and other surrounding districts on how we can share programming um, and so they're very interested in our career center program they do a little bit of a different way of um, introducing their program to their board we bring our plan of study to the board I don't believe that is a policy that they have to do but they are planning on second semester 
we will allow our students to be able to participate in the CAPS program and their students will be able to participate in our Career Center programming. So we have a lot of meetings to get together. It'll be bringing our counselors and their counselors together to really figure out the logistics and then a sharing agreement would likely probably come before the board before it's all finalized. Which I'm not mistaken, that's groundbreaking. That's not it happened. Is. That yep. has not yep. happened since I've been on this board. So it's a pretty big deal, that kind of collaborative effort. I just want to point that out. So the, um, the last thing I want to tell you is just please note the list of classes that we have <coughs> deleted and added in the board exhibit. If there are some specific questions you have about those, I can answer those questions for you either now or later. The one I wanted to highlight is we, because I'm so excited about this one, is in the music program. And we're actually piloting a, vo a new vocal uh, music course at East High this next semester and then we've added it into um, the high school planning guide starting next semester but we're piloting already that is called wings and it's a vocal uh, music that is based on uh, different types of vocal genres with an emphasis a heavy emphasis in gospel and so we believe oh, that it's a course that truly uh, meets some of the cultural um, needs and, and an ec in an equity kind of way of thinking. Um, we're excited about that. We also are having current conversations, although the, the class has not been added and won't be added right now. But we're also talking about um, a drum line. Again, getting, uh, you know, getting some kids who wouldn't take music in any other way, but they're out there marching around, drumming on the drums and all of that kind of stuff in parades and in other organizations. And so we're looking at what the cost might be for that, what, how we would get that started. And if we can figure all of that out, we're going to try to pilot it maybe second semester next, next year. That's the goal. So that's not in here, but just to tell you that we're trying to be um, creative and responsive to getting our kids engaged in school and um, you know, um, providing opportunities for them to say, I want to go to school today. So that's the intent, and um, to honor the cultures that we have, the subcultures that we have in our community. Any other questions? Is the uh, marching band credit, is that on CNN or is there, is that, is that common in other districts or is something that we're kind of you know I don't know if that's common in other districts um, the music folks came to me and said because we have our students going to what what I call band camp before a school starts for their marching part and most of the time they are out there on the field at zero hour we decided that we needed to be able to honor the time that they give and give them a quarter credit and then they will get their concert band credit that semester as well as their marching band credit um, it will be treated a little bit differently between East and West. West High has enough kids that if a student comes in and says, I really want to do concert band, but I'm unable to do the marching band, they actually can choose, or they can do both. At East High, they need all of their band kids to do the marching band at this point in time. That's a growing program, but it's not to the point where we can offer it quite like that. Mm -hmm. So East High kids, all their band kids will be in that marching program, or West because there's enough of, I mean, there's so many of them, that we can offer that choice. The goal is for East High students eventually to have that choice as well. At the very bottom, they're going to get credit for it. Yeah. So well, I think it's good. So I appreciate yeah. your. Thank you. I agree. That's a good change. Yeah. Has anything in the IB department changed since everything started with our with that? Uh, we curriculum? have. Um, if you go to the ex the exhibit, the list of courses, we are switching out some courses. We have deleted the IB physics, and that was not a, a gargantuan, um, exciting. What am I say? A popular course. So students weren't taking that, and we do offer it um, AP physics if they're real interested in that. Um, but what we did was then we actually um, added a sports exercise and health science IB course that will become much more popular and has the possibility of connecting in some way to our health science pathway as well. Um, that's um, if you look up that course it's, it's a very interesting course I would like to take that course if I were still in school um, we looked at where are we getting the bang for a buck out of IB so we switched out and paired back and then added to get what we absolutely needed so there have been some changes that way so within IB you have you want to come up here, 
Well, I'm just asking, within IB, there are mm -hmm. options of different directions you can yes. go and still be within that curriculum? Yes, there are. Okay. And based on uh, popularity is how you choose which ones you're going or and, and also, I suppose, with the teachers that are available. Yeah, that's part of it, too. It's not just on popularity, but uh, they have to have a certain number of courses mm -hmm. in each one of their air, each one of the IB areas. And then um, we have to be able to supply the teachers for that, too. And next year, we will not have an IB physics teacher trained to do this. Thank you. And we had very teeny, tiny, small numbers this year as well. So we believe that the science will be met through other programming. Any interest in elongating class periods for uh, any curriculum other than the Career Center? That has not been a conversation on the table at this point in time. I don't know if you're asking me for my personal opinion, but I cannot. We just haven't had that, that okay. conversation. So you're talking about block classes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are you asking me my opinion? Um, not necessarily. Okay. I just wondered if it had been No, part of we have discussion. not had that discussion. You can give me your opinion if you want. Oh my gosh, I am so in favor of block classes. I think it gives teachers the amount of time that they need to really let kids dig into that. But that is not something that we would, as district administrators, stand up and say, you're going to do this. That needs to rise out of the ranks of the schools themselves and say, we need to do this. We need block scheduling to do this, to do this programming accurately. Something else that we saw in our travels before we kind of came to the decisions that we did had to do with com combination classes where you would have a, a physics class with an, with an English class. And that's what Crystal was talking about. We have two English classes that are going to be paired up with um, the digital graphics and the elementary education. So they will be able to take those. Now we haven't, they're two separate standalone courses. That's the first step. And eventually, if we can embed those, we can. When we started looking at, there is cur national curriculum, um, curriculum out there for instance, um, algebra and construction or geometry and construction. So when we get to that point, if that's a pathway, we will look at those curriculums and start Im embedding that kind of um, content with those. So that's far, the it's dream, just the that's English. the intent. So far, it's just the English. We had to start small right. and with something that we knew we could get our, our heads and our hands wrapped around. And this, will, this should work really well. So are there two teachers in that classroom? Uh, we think there'll be probably one teacher where we don't have that staff yet. It'll come from somebody currently that we have on staff. That would be That's the eligible, eligible to, to teach. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, they have to be endorsed as English. Right. And I just want to say I'm, I'm all for a lot of the specialization. I think that's really good and it's attractive. But I want, us, I want to be somewhat cautious so that we don't get so specialized that those students in the middle that we're trying to help graduate, that we don't use up too many of our resources, our human resources, as well as our other technical resources that, you know, I don't know, does that make sense? Yes, it does right, make sense. Right, because, you know, um, I, I think it's really good with the IB and all those things. It's good to have that specialization. And I, and I truly believe that there is a niche for that. And we, we want to retain those parents and those students to keep them engaged in the Waterloo School District. But we also do have a very real problem of those students in the middle. So I just want to, you know, voice my s concern that we don't get too specialized. Mm -hmm. For, and for now. De Debbie in here, that. I was wondering as far as the standard and the honors and the core diploma, um, none of that has actually um, changed and that is totally explained to oh. students. Yes, that will be totally explained to the students. That's it. Core diploma is not necessarily advertised, although now I'm talking to all these people about it. But it is it, the core and the honors is by application. And when our counselors or teachers or administrators say, this child, you know, all I wish you had a chance to sit down and read the applications this last year. I've been a part of that. They are heart wrenching. Um, students who are living on their own, students who are helping a mother who has cancer, a student who um, 
uh, the parents kicked a student out of the home. There are there is such difficult situations that a small percentage of our students live in. If there's any way that we can give them uh, a special consideration through the core diploma, they still have to meet what's required by law. But we can pair some of that, which we've done and, and done a really good job with that. Des Moines is actually looking at our, our uh, policy in that. The more we can do for students like that while holding it's a balance it's helping our students but part of my job is also protecting the uh, Waterloo diploma so it's, it's a very careful balance and we've talked about a minimum number using the core we are pushing the honors making sure people know about the honors as much as possible um, that one you know can go off the charts with the number but it's careful we have to be very careful because the preponderance of students still need to go for the standard diploma or the honors diploma and the core is very judiciously used to meet the needs of a, of a student here and there who truly has this incredible barrier to them getting through school and and they have to write what that barrier is that is on the application right and I guess if, if maybe like if I was a parent and I was receiving this mm -hmm. okay I would think well my student could choose which diploma they would want to get so I just I just don't want to confuse people that they can look at this and say well heck I'm gonna go with the one that's 35 yeah, hours they would find out very quickly mm -hmm. it's not a choice mm -hmm. it's a recommendation and the student then has to make application and they still have to have four years of school four years in our high schools it, it does not let them out of school early and they cannot make application until later in the spring if if needed till later into their um, sophomore year and we really are hoping they wait until their junior or senior year for that so there are there are um, what I want to say there are parameters there that we believe that um, really narrow that down mm -hmm. to the use but we knew we needed something like that the other thing that you reminded me of, uh, Ms. Flynn, is that um, you guys need to understand that the change in science changes our policy 602.5, high school graduation. If you approve this tonight, then we're going to have to bring that policy back for approval at some later date in another month or two. So please make sure that you are aware of that as well. It does change our high school graduation expectations. does not change the number of credits that kids need. but originally we had physical science and biology ninth and tenth grade and then they could take whatever they wanted to take in science we are now requiring them you know it's earth and space science biology and then a physical science one of those choices we're requiring three years of specified science which is a little bit different mm -hmm. right and then the only other thing under um, page seven under the scholarships um, I see you have West High and East High listed, but I do know our Expo students are eligible for um, lots of scholarships. I've seen that in the, in the paper. So just maybe for future, if we would put a reference to, um, you know, like even the um, community foundation site that lists scholarships and so that um, because the Expo students are definitely eligible for scholarships but I think if we could direct them where to go I will note that the other thing that you also know from years past is that you approve this on a conceptual basis and we go in and continue to make changes as they are needed we don't necessarily add courses or or conceptually change anything but we correct code numbers and course numbers and add things like that in fact tonight I just had earlier this afternoon I had a meeting with ELL and there had been some changes made in that from the copy you got last week um, so we continually do that the most recent copy will be on our always on our website but we can go in and see if we can't make some changes to that um, I appreciate that I'll check with Expo to see how they guide their students through that this was what West and East gave me and so I should have probably said you know this has been sitting in here for years so I probably should have said hey where's Expos but I will go back and do that and see if we can't add something okay. why, why is it not why don't we do it consistent between the two schools on how we locate that information it's just how they choose to do that they give it to you us. know East High says go to this website and West High says they're listed under here it, it's how the how the department and how the school chooses to do that I don't we don't micromanage to that level right. so yeah. Dr. Lee can I ask you one quick question that's sure. uh, somewhat of an aside if we're done here mm -hmm. 
what um, what are we doing for those students who are judicially challenged um, in addition to at risk those that we expel for a whole school year who are not getting any credits from anywhere are we working with juvenile court services who can help with that I believe so and that actually would be in Cora, Cora Turner's wheelhouse to answer but please know that we make use of our online courses quite a bit in our virtual school and we can provide uh, credit earning opportunities for students through that virtual school I, I was told that if a student was expelled that we don't offer them any credit is that correct I think we s we they can we do we not from us directly but right. they can go they can use online resources and continue to take classes if Thank they you. have an IEP they are offered services based on their IEP but yep. beyond that if they're expelled they're expelled yeah so. yeah mm -hmm. and then they have to virtual do so many credits their last so many credits here to get a diploma from yep from Waterloo schools but the online courses are at their expense I think they are I just would like some are more expensive would you like some clarification on that for Miss Turner we can provide that to you yes please because okay. I, I'm concerned about um, when students are expelled because that affects our numbers in the long run oh, sure. yeah. yeah you mentioned uh, counselors earlier um, and I think I just need to highlight that again because my children have gone through this the Waterloo school system and um, I think counselors were underused and underutilized mm -hmm. and students suffered because of that in the past and I just really want to stress that we use our yeah. counselors and instruct our counselors yeah. especially yeah. even in the seventh and eighth grade level to be sure that students understand the direction they're going and what they have to do to get to that point because uh, without that knowledge they're not going to uh, be able to choose the correct classes and the tr correct curriculum to get their goal that so. is true and well and just to to piggyback on that that's exactly why we're for the first time ever having these eighth grade mandatory meetings for parents and their students to talk about the process of scheduling and registering for high school and what that looks like and what the options are um, and that's where Dr. Lindemann headed and I think Jesse you're going to be out of here and shortly um, and and that is why uh, Mike I just want to concur that that um, counseling component and that knowing what is expected and how you get there and what questions to ask and how, where to go to to get your answers answered um, your questions answered is super important and, and so I'm really excited we're doing those and, and maybe there's a technology ad that we we need to uh, pursue with vigor and that would be to relieve some of the counselors from scheduling duties yeah, make so scheduling more automated so that they have more time to counsel instead of schedule students. so we're yeah. working on that we're working on that we're looking at ways that we can use our student information system infinite campus mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. great all right anything further then on the um, high school planning guide clearly we are not without questions mrs. miss Lee thank you for answering all of those we appreciate it well anytime that you have additional questions or if you walk out and think of them please know that um, we are available to you and anytime that you need more information we are open to answering that or showing you or helping you understand or whatever and Great. your suggestions are all welcomed as well so email me if you see something that needs to be added I've told everybody that works with us on this I don't care if it's January March middle of summer early fall if you see something in the high school planning guide that just doesn't ring true or it doesn't look right or if it's misspelled or we've got the wrong number or something let us know we immediately get it corrected it takes a lot of eyes on a document this big thank you so much thanks dr. Lee thank you crystal and thank you to the teachers and the four of you that are back here tonight for spending your time and being put on the spot we sure appreciate it so um, then all those in favor of recommending the high school planning guide please signify by saying aye aye those opposed same sign I'm I'm gonna abstain I simply don't understand enough about the proposed science uh, changes to pass judgment at this point so okay. I'm gonna abstain one abstention um, chair votes aye motion carried thank you that will take us then to the next item on our agenda which is exhibit I <coughs> and the recommended motion is that the board approve the resolutions directing the sale of school infrastructure sales service and use tax revenue refunding bonds series 2017 as presented 
So moved. And a second? Second. Thank you. I don't know, you two can arm wrestle for Mike. Um, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Coughlin for a little bit more background on this. Hey, just to, <laughs> just to refresh the process that we have gone through in the minutes that are actually in this board agenda uh, from December 12th was mm -hmm. the resolution directing the sale mm -hmm. of uh, $43.5 million worth of uh, sales tax revenue bonds, uh, refunding bonds, because they're really to, to refinance a $52 million sale that we had back in 2011. Well, uh, this, these motions tonight are to finalize that sale. But what that sale does is uh, sells bonds uh, early because those bonds are not callable or pay off early uh, under that stipulation until July of uh, 2019. 2019. But with the interest rates that were available, um, we could uh, complete this sale now uh, put that money in escrow, which would then make the payments on the old bonds until they were ready to be paid off. Uh, just kind of, they kind of finance themselves, and then we just uh, start paying on the new bonds immediately. So it's kind of a two year hold process um, to complete the whole uh, refinancing of the old bonds. But again, to just uh, tell you the value of doing this we were able to uh, refinance the remaining balance mm -hmm. at just a little over half of what we were paying wow. in interest before of 2.65 percent and we were at 5.02 so uh, we are expecting through the calculations of the uh, Piper Jaffrey of the result savings of approximately $5.3 million in interest. Now these again are not for any new construction, new um, projects that we are doing. They are just refinancing the debt that we had from 2011. So the resolutions are purely just to assign mm -hmm. um, Bankers Trust of Des Moines to be the the holder of the money uh, and if to my experience they handle 99% uh, of all of the bond holdings in the state for schools uh, there's also just a, a tax exempt certificate that um, is approved through this process um, and then also for um, just completing the purchase of the 43.5 uh, in bonds, but after the final interest rates came in, that actually calculated a final number of 43 million, oh, 45,000 even. So, and that's with um, all of the all of the fees paid. Um, so that's what was resulting in. Uh, the bond sale which will pay off the old bonds which will then result in the five million dollar savings of the interest for the rest of um, yeah. rest of the time period right. yeah I think so and just to be clear this isn't for general fund these are sa this is save this is all save money. save money yeah, yeah. okay great I would just like to commend Michael and his staff for identifying, uh, explaining, and executing this process. If we look at our objectives up here under environment, the second sentence is secure, organize, and optimize financial resources. So this is a significant contribution to that goal. Um, please yeah, yeah. tell your staff, mm -hmm. good job. We're all happy yeah. that that happened, so thank oh, you. For sure. And Angie, the numbers um, aspect of it, or not Angie, Rhonda, sorry. Um, she asked the question, said numbers, you know. In simple terms, you know how people refinance the mortgages on their house to add a better interest rate for a shorter period of time. That's kind of just the sure. same, same concept we can say we did here. So save money. Yeah. 
Save, save money. Save, save money. Exactly. New logo. Um, Mr. Coughlin, just for our viewers at home, I thought it might be worth reading the three different resolutions. Also, they're not in the actual um, board recommendation, but I thought it right. might be worth doing that. And I'm, I can do that if, or you can, it doesn't matter, but I thought maybe we should go ahead and get those out there too. So, okay, I can read those first. Thank you. First one is resolution appointing Bankers Trust Company of Des Moines, Iowa to serve as trustee, approving the trust indenture and authorizing the execute execution of same uh, resolution two: the form of tax exemption certificate to be placed on file and approved and third uh, resolution is the resolution authorizing and providing for the terms of issuance and securing the payment of forty three million forty five thousand dollars of school infrastructure sales service and use tax revenue refunding bonds series 2017 of the Waterloo Community School District State of Iowa under the provisions of chapter 423 E and 423 F of the Code of Iowa and providing for a method of payment of said bonds excellent thank you so that's what the uh, the board approved the resolutions those were the three resolutions included in our um, are there any further questions then for Mr. Coughlin this evening Seeing none, this also is a roll call vote, so I'm going to start to my left. So all those in favor of the recommended motion approving those three resolutions, please signify by saying aye. Mm -hmm. Jesse Knight? Yes. Angela Weekly? Aye. Sue Flynn? Aye. Rhonda McCrina? Aye. Mike Kinchy? Aye. Lyle Schmidt? Aye. And Shanley McNally Chair votes aye. Motion carried. Thank you all. And thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. The next item on our agenda is funding for 2017-2016 at-risk education. And that recommended motion is that the Board of Education authorize the district's administration to submit a request to the School Board Review Committee, SBRC, in the amount of $3,570,641 for modified supplemental amount, MSA, for the purpose of funding district at-risk programming. And a second? Second. Thank you. And discussion? I know that um, Dr. McNulty's here tonight and Mr. McCoughlin's here tonight. If any of you have questions. Well, I can run through the financing part of it and then the program <laughs> uh, can turn over to Dr. McNulty. Um, just looking at the exhibit uh, information on page 57, there's really two parts to this. This is the second year that the state has combined this at-risk money together, mm -hmm. which is divided into what's called supplemental uh, at-risk funding, and that is a formula that comes through the aid and levy based on uh, free and reduced lunch uh, and enrollment. Um, and the amount, the estimated amount that we uh, know right now is 482,521. And then there's also the modified allowable growth, which is based on uh, the regular program district cost, which is uh, our enrollment times the state cost per pupil. And then 5% of that is what we can uh, apply for for at-risk funding, modified allowable growth at-risk funding. Uh, and then uh, the requirement of that is that the the district has to match 25 percent of that number uh, to get the total so let me just if you want to look back on page 59 um, that really breaks it out if you want to see the actual mm -hmm. details of it but you can see uh, in the 1718 revenue column there's the enrollment times the uh, cost per pupil mm -hmm times 5% and then add 25% of it. So uh, the total budget for modified allowable growth is 4,760,856. Uh, of that, the 3,576,41 is what would be uh, raised in property tax and that is estimated to be at $1.34. Um, in addition, then the at-risk supplemental plan is the 482,521, so a total revenue for all at-risk programs of 5,243,377. Uh, 
and then uh, following in the bottom box um, the way that we um, apply for this um, is by designating our programs and you can see as you look down the left hand side uh, programs that you're familiar with but it's divided into four different services and those are the the bolded underlined categories and then the programs of uh, Crossroads summer school PBDA under credit recovery and so on as you go down the list um, this is what is uh, put in for the budget for 1718 and we have to do this this early because it has to go through the school budget review committee in time for them to approve it which then can be processed for our published budget in March and April so it's it's kind of a year behind or I guess you say the other way it's a year ahead of yeah. schedule uh, we're approving it a year before it happens but to get it into the tax structure uh, that's the timing that we have to follow so that's the breakdown of of the money if you've got any questions on that or on any other program issues Michael just to clarify that top numbers that you talked about there so 5% gives you the 3.5 million and then the we have to provide 25% of that amount correct so it's 25% of the 5% correct okay and if we didn't do this this would we would not then have the authority to use this money for these services is that correct well we would just have to spend general fund general money. fund but this but, allows us but to this is an allowance of revenue that we can use specifically for at-risk programs absolutely which then helps our general fund stay correct. even more flush okay and quick question <laughs> uh, if we identify additional at-risk programming that could help our school district would we be able to later on add those to it we do have flexibility within the process um, you know one of the things that I think that we're getting much better is targeting our, our at-risk dollars you know I think under the leadership of Dr. Lindemann in the high schools it was a big impact on a graduation rate last year mm -hmm. um, focusing on credit recovery uh, you see also supplemental services uh, available for our family resource uh, support and also for mm -hmm. summer school you know as we look at advancing we just can't hope that summer school at the high school level does the trick that we have to also engage some of our middle school students and even unfortunately some of our elementary students as we lose some state aid at, at the elementary level so this money has to be certainly well thought of thought out with our strategic planning process so that we target and use it effectively and, and I asked because I remember I think when my son was at Carver there was a program called tomorrow's leaders that worked with african-american males ages 11 to 18 I just didn't see it on here I didn't know if it discontinued but that's something we could look into later but sure I, and I, I know that was a, an effective program I yeah think. and there's there's a number of other programs out there and and we worked with the state this last spring in looking at some guidance regarding opportunities to uh, support effective programming and they're, they're very much willing to work with us but we have to start this initial process because yeah, um, without the process being started we have no dialogue so the other part of that answer is yes we can be very flexible with the programming that we offer but this is the maximum of amount of money that we can apply for so we would have to adjust within this total so when we proceed with the certified budget later on and we we decide 14 15 mils whatever it is for the, as a total levy uh, this mill and a half is included in that number yes okay Thank you. But it can't be. Th is one three four the max, or is that one three four is the max? max. But it could be less. Could be less. It depends on what in what valuation does. Sure. Okay. But we would probably choose if we wanted to pair the total number, we'd probably choose cash reserve or something else to offset. Well, we would have to have the authority to spend it. Cash reserve would not give us that right to spend it on at risk. We still have to yeah. have the authority by right. formula to be able to use those dollars. So this gives us the authority, but Correct. my point is, if if we if we want to make sure the total number is under X, yeah. we can always pair the cash reserve levy. Correct. Later. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I understand what you're asking. Yeah. Yes. 
All right. A few more numbers for everybody. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Are there Mr. McNulty? Okay. Great. Well, there might be other questions, but on pertaining directly to <laughs> item J. So, great. Then all those in favor of the recommended motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Chair votes aye. Motion carried. That takes us to the next item on our agenda, which is Exhibit K. Um, and this is the second reading. We had the first reading um, back in December of these. Um, and the recommended motion is the board approve the following policies. Board member conflicts of interest, school board member ethics, gifts to the Board of Education members, and meeting notices and minutes. So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. Um, I, if I recall, if I can go back to December, I think, and still pull this out, that um, uh, Tara Thomas spoke that evening about this was really cleaning up language and kind of making sure that we were in alignment with IASB and, and other things. Um, there wasn't a lot of content change, but like the word board had been capitalized and we took it down to lower cases. You guys can see all those, but um, for our viewers at home. So it is those one, two, three, four, five different policies. Um, and I don't know if anybody has any further questions on those. Okay. Well then, seeing none, all those um, uh, all those in favor of approving the policy changes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Chair votes aye. Motion carried. Obviously, we're not going to do our superintendent's report, or she's not going to phone it in at this point. So she said we'll get we'll get a double dose um, in two weeks when when we're all back together. Um, and so with that, I'm going to start. I'm going to go the other way from roll call. I'm going to go to my right, and I'm going to start with Lyle Schmidt tonight on uh, bo board comments. Okay, thanks, Lyle. <laughs> Wait, I thought you were jotting down notes while we were talking. So, great. All right, Mike Kinchy. I don't have anything tonight. Thank okay. you. Okay, Rhonda. Happy New Year. Thank you, Suflin. I did have one comment. As far as if any of our viewers would like to make donations, is your mic on? Nope. There we go. If any of our viewers would like to make donations to the Kingsley Group. Mm -hmm. Can we get that information? How, um, who should they call, Pam? Or sure. call the superintendent's office and we will take any donation, donations of animal books. <laughs> we will take donations no of cash, money. We would just love for those little kids just no to animals. succeed. Yeah, no animals, just no, books. Just no, yeah. we don't want any, <laughs> no any ferrets or polar bears <laughs> or anything like that. But No ring-tailed lemurs. No, but uh, seriously, if you would like to, it's an awesome group to donate to. And I just, um, as Rhonda said, I'm going to send some money and just, um, just to see them succeed and the look on their eyes. So contact Pam in um, the superintendent's office and that's 291 433 433 I'm off sorry three. go ahead 433-1874 okay mm -hmm. got it 433-1874 <laughs> and let's get those kids to Ames thank you awesome <laughs> all right sorry. anything further Sue that's it. No, all right Angie you. I just want to remind all the viewers and students and parents that MLK Day is coming up and he fought so much for us to have education and for us to volunteer and contribute to our community so as we have the day off think of it as a day on what can you do for the community that you live in and not as a day off in making sure that you can um, further your education and help out your fellow man thank you and woman do you want to talk about hidden figures I kind of thought I shouldn't but I guess I can also, the um, the STEM group that came in December and and talked about uh, what they are preparing to do, they are wanting to bring at least 200 students, and they would welcome any more students to um, Hidden Figures on MLK Day as their is their gift to service um, from nine to one. Um, if you are interested in that information, I know that. I can get the information to Pam, and um, you can call her at that same number, 433-1874. <laughs> I memorize numbers easy. Um, I was calling the bus bar. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, a, a so that uh, Mr. Um, Dick Urban, Urban, how's that how you say his yeah. name? Can um, get a final count there. Um, just try, they really, really want to make sure that they're able to impact, especially um, women and um, students of color 
to be inspired by this hidden figures which we've talked about now for three three meetings, three meetings. Yeah. so just um, don't call it hidden and figures. yes kevin kevin Ka costner is in it however the lead is um Traji P. Henson. Yeah. So, <laughs> and it's also important for uh, non-minority students to learn this part of their history because I don't think this was in the history books. And so, you know, Lala, you know, I, I agree with you to the standpoint that some things are left out, maybe, possibly. Mm -hmm. And um, so we want other students to come and see that part of history where women of color were, were very critical and instrumental in sending um, Americans to the moon. Space. John Glenn right. asked for them specifically. That's right. So yes, he did. And, and Rhonda and I will be there to help chaperone some of the students. <laughs> oh no, I'm not chaperoning nobody's kids. She, <laughs> she is. It's on her calendar. Look. <laughs> 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 oh, you guys made me I think, laugh. I think Tori's going, so you it's can, really you can have good. her. I'll be there. It's really good. So, all right, Jesse. We've I, got, I got none after we've this. We've obviously this. lost control. <laughs> okay, but I think we need to reiterate the eighth grade meetings, the mm -hmm. times I, and places. I was just okay. about to do good. that. Yep. The times and places are posted on our Waterloo Community Schools. Um, there are six of them, I believe. Um, so the first one is tonight, or four of them? Oh, there's five. There's four. one down yeah, here. So there's five. There's five. five. Five, not six. Sorry. I know there's one down here. Um, one each middle school and one makeup. Yep. Yep. So we will get those up on our website, or I don't have them off the top of my head. They're in an email somewhere. They've been on social media, too. Mm -hmm. so. We've posted them a lot. They're on the... Um, they are on our Facebook page, I know, because I've seen them. And there was an ad in yesterday's uh, Courier uh, about them, or a placement about them. And so, yep, and they're on each individual school. So make sure for that. I also just want to remind um, all of our parents of high school students that finals are next week. They do matter. Um, <laughs> so please make sure your kids get rested and, and get there for those um, couple of days. Um, they're, you know, they test over a two-day period, so just make sure they get there. Um, and also that our next meeting is not until January 23rd. And with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Great. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Yay. Chair votes aye. We're adjourned. Good night. Thank you. For... My daughter...